All right. What is up, tycoons? What's up, traders? Coming at you guys today with a very important video on the decay behind Boyle. And there's also actually decay behind UNG. So I'm going to describe that decay to you guys, explain it to you. There are some dangers, but there's some really big myths that a lot of people don't understand when it comes to investing in leveraged ETFs. It's not always just a huge downside risk. There is actually a potential upside to it. So make sure you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel if you guys are new, um, and definitely watch all the way to the end of the video, okay? As the video progresses, um, that's when we're really going to go over some of these myths, and there's some really, really crucial charts and important information that you guys need to see and visualize so you can truly understand, all right? Um, but we're gonna start off here and just go over UNG and then progress a little bit deeper. This is gonna be a little bit of a longer video, but that's because you know the information is just really needed and there's a lot of good info and I'm just gonna try my best to make it as short as possible, but it will be a little bit longer. So let's jump straight into it. And if you take a look at it here, UNG versus Boyle uh, performance comparison, right? Let's say you invested $10,000 in UNG and Boyle since October 6th of 2011, right? Boyle's return would be a total return of 99.9%, negative 99.9%, and UNG would be a return of negative 94.28%. Now, in just the five years alone, right? This is a five year chart right here with UNG in blue and Boyle in orange, okay, Boyle in the past five years would have returned negative 98.5% and UNG would have returned at negative 63.96%. Okay, so these are some of the key characteristics, right? You can take a look at the one year performance, the five year performance uh, annualized, 10 year annualized, all right? Um, but really, a large factor of this, right, of this really bad performance in these two is because of the different types of decay in here. Uh, if you take a look at the volatility comparison, uh, the volatility of UNG is currently about 93%, and the volatility of Boyle is going to be about 173%. Now, uh, Boyle is going to be 2x leveraged, so it kind of makes sense that it's roughly about two times the volatility. That would make sense, right? Now, let's move into the next slide here. Um, and we can see, you know, based off this headline right here, boil, boiling it down, avoid this fund. And you can see why, right? When we looked at the past performance, uh, it's definitely a very bad return for investors, right? The boil ETF, however, it provides 2x leverage to the Bloomberg Natural Gas Sub Index. It is a rolling futures fund. We'll get into that in a little bit. But it suffers from roll decay when the futures curve is in contango. It is also a levered ETF, so it suffers from volatility decay. The combination of roll decay and volatility decay has caused the Boyle ETF to produce an abysmal negative 41% over the 10 years. Most investors should avoid this fund. All right. Um, but most commodities can't be held directly because of complicated and costly storage. Right. And so that's why people invest in ETFs. All right. Uh, most of the ETFs, therefore, realize the long position in a commodity by buying corresponding futures. So when you're buying the ETFs, a lot of times you're buying an ETF that's holding the corresponding futures to whatever that commodity is. Once the futures contracts are approaching expiration, the fund sells them and then buys futures with a further out expiration. It is in fact a perpetual rolling in time. This rolling, however, is taking a toll on the fund's net asset value, the NAV, the NAV. That's because most commodities are in contango most of the time. Contango is a normal situation where further out contracts are more expensive than the nearby contracts. By rolling the positions, the fund is repeatedly selling cheaper nearby contracts and buying more expensive further out contracts. Buying expensive and selling cheap translates into a loss for the fund. So overall, Boyle is also not suitable for investors typically, but UNG is also going to suffer from this as well and you know, is not suitable for holding over long periods of time as it suffers from decay a lot. However, what's a disadvantage for someone can be an opportunity for someone else. All right. And if we take a look, the reason for such a high rate of decay is going to be shown here in the next chart. It's the term structure for the underlying natural gas futures contracts. 
basically nothing more than the closing prices on November 25th, 2015 for the futures contracts expiring in about a year. As you can see, the contracts that are closer are much cheaper than those far away. So we can see here, you know, the contracts are about 2.2 over here. And the further out you go, they're 2.7, 2.6, 2.5. They gradually increase the further out you go. So that's the contango part that we were talking about earlier. They're selling when these are close to expiration, they're selling their futures contracts and then purchasing further out expiration. So they're selling cheap future contracts and buying more expensive ones. And so that has a lot to do with the decay in UNG and BOIL. Um, and this state is not ex exceptional, right? On the contrary, contango and natural gas is positive most of the time, as you can see in the contango histogram between the nearest two contracts, uh, which UNG actually holds, right? For the past five years and so this right here is going to be zero percent and you can see over the past five years it's been positive okay meaning that you know there's they're basically overpaying they're selling cheap right and then buying expensive when it comes to the futures contracts um boil and cold right cold is also another etf related to ung or i'm sorry it's a natural gas but they are leveraged short-term trading tools right and this is a big part okay short-term trading tools OK, that's how I use them. Um, you know, that's how I would use boil and cold. I know some people like to buy shares and hold it for a very long swing trade. But to me, these things are pretty much like either next day swing trade or same day trade. And you're really just looking to capture some of that movement. Right. I mean, sometimes you'll see boil go up 10, 15, 20 percent in a day. And, you know, that's a pretty nice game. Right. If you, you know, you can capture that or some of that move. Um, you know, I definitely feel comfortable taking profits on a move like that, especially if it's a one day trade. But these are leveraged short term trading tools for those seeking exposure to natural gas on the long and short side of the market without venturing into the highly leveraged and margin futures arena. And so, you know, a lot of people kind of get scared about futures and trading futures. It's definitely very highly leveraged. And, you know, you're going to need margin accounts, um, you know, to trade the futures. But the leverage and risk of rolling from one contract to the next make these proper products only appropriate for short-term long or short-term short positions in natural gas. Natural gas's price variance and leverage make price and time stops the optimal approach to risk management when using boil and cold. And so cold is going to be the the, the short version of boil. Okay, it's going to be the, uh, you're basically betting on natural gas to go down with cold and then cold would go up. Natural gas is an exciting and volatile market, but it's not for the faint of heart. The volatility can be head spinning. So careful attention to risk reward dynamics and discipline are critical for success, right? There's a reason they call this thing the widow maker is, you know, a lot of people uh, get burned and, you know, really just lose tons of money. Or, you know, there is certain people who are able to, you know, make the right trades and you can really make a substantial amount of money uh, if you know what you're doing, right? And, you know, you have a little bit of luck on your side and, and things work in your favor. But the natural gas market overall is not a market for investing, but it can be a trader's paradise, okay, as volatility translates to opportunities. Now, me personally, as a trader, I love volatility and I need volatility, right? That's what I identify as, right? A lot of people identify as a lot of different stuff these days. I like to identify as volatility. Uh, that's what I really want to be in my core, okay? Because without volatility, I can't trade, right? If things are just flat and just gradually moving up 0.2%, 0.15%, 1%, I can't come in there and find trade opportunities. So I really need that volatility around so that way as a trader i can take long positions i can take short positions um and you know ultimately make some gains by trading the most direct route for a long or short risk position is via the futures and the futures options on the cme's uh nymex division so that's definitely going to be the most direct way to do it and it's also going to help you uh avoid some of the you know negative decay factors in ung boil and cold if you're just directly trading the futures contracts um, you know, versus trading some of the other ETFs. Now, Boyle provides the 2x daily return of an index that measures the price performance of natural gas as reflected through the publicly traded natural gas futures contracts. And cold provides negative 2x exposure to an index that tracks U.S. natural gas prices by holding one second month futures contract at a time. 
But there's some really important info that I'm about to go over, all right, um, that really can shine a light on the myths around holding leveraged ETFs, okay? So let's go over what leverage is. It's basically the amount invested in the market divided by the in to total investable assets owned. Therefore, if you have $100 to your name and invest all $100 into the market, your leverage ratio or multiple is one, although you are not using any leverage in a binary definition. For example, this can represent any traditional index fund or ETF investment held in a long position. If, on the other hand, you borrow another $100 and invest a total of $200 into the market, your leverage multiple is two, making you 2x leveraged. And of course, if you have $100 and decide not to invest, your leverage multiple is zero, meaning you have no exposure to the market at all. Investing in a 2x leveraged ETF gives you 2x leverage in the market, which is, in theory, the same leverage and market exposure as borrowing money to reach 2x leverage instead. To reiterate, in traditional investing with zero leverage, the leverage multiple is not zero, but in fact, 1x. And the kicker is that daily fluctuations will always hurt overall returns, regardless of how much leverage is used. We refer to this as volatility decay, and the paper used the term volatility drag. But the point is that this occurs with any degree of market exposure, even without using leverage, right? Because you're going to be 1x and there's always going to be, you know, the, the volatility decay, all right? There's always going to be daily fluctuations that will always hurt your overall returns. The math is simple, right? If the market goes down by X one day and up by the same X the next day, the net returns after the two days are given by this formula. Returns equal one plus X times one minus X, and that's going to equal one minus X two. Because X two is positive, but the sign in front is negative, your position will always suffer a loss of X two. The example is that the market goes down 5% one day, then up by 5%. The net result is going to be 1 minus 0 0.05 times 1 plus 0 0.05, and that's going to equal 0 0.9975, a loss of 0 0.052, which is a loss roughly of about 2.25%. So even if you're at what uh, um, you know like one x leverage, right? And typically people think that's not leveraged. Um, you know you're still gonna suffer even if the market if the market goes down you know five percent one day and then goes back up five percent the next day. You're still missing out there and you know experiencing that volatility decay and you're at a loss of 0.25 percent. Thus, any daily loss requires a greater percentage daily gain in the future to return to original value. Increasing leverage increases the value of X and therefore X2, causing greater volatility decay. Decreasing leverage decreases the value of X and therefore X2, causing less volatility decay. However, volatility decay is not unique to leveraged ETFs and occurs with any degree of market exposure. The leverage ratio multiplies X. The only way to avoid volatility decay is to only invest in non-volatile assets, such as CDs, or to not invest in the market at all. Suppose we reduce leverage to 0.5x by leaving half of our money uninvested. Although we've reduced our market exposure by one half, we've reduced our susceptibility to volatility decay by one fourth. However, most investors would balk at this despite the promise of less volatility decay, as they would rightly point out that leaving half your money uninvested seems suboptimal. In the other hand, uh, we go beyond 1x leverage to say 2x, we increase the effect of volatility decay by 4x, but also increase our market exposure. Yet most investors balk at any leverage over 1x because volatility decay is bad. For some reason, conventional wisdom has decided that employing no leverage, which is in fact a 1x multiple, might strike the optimal balance between volatility decay and capture market returns. Yet there's nothing special about a 1x multiple, nor any inherent reason that 1x leverage is optimal. The optimal amount of leverage under historical market conditions might be 0.8x, 1.2x, or 1.5x, or some such. It is very unlikely to be neatly 1x. In fact, it is no secret that, at least in the past decade, if an investor used a buy and hold strategy on many popular 2x or 3x leveraged ETFs, 
they would have significantly outperformed a 1x buy and hold strategy of the underlying asset. And this is a great example, guys, right? So the blue is going to be the S&P 500. and red, we have SSO. This is a 2x leverage. And then in orange here, we have UPRO, okay? A 3x leverage S&P 500 ETF. And this is the portfolio growth of $10,000 from January 2010 to August 2021. If you would have invested in UPRO, that $10,000 would be $323,000, guys. That is a lot of money, okay? Compared to the $50,000 that it would have returned if you had just invested in the 1X leverage S&P 500 SPY ETF. OK, and if you would have chosen the 2x leverage ETF SSO, you'd be up one hundred and forty seven thousand dollars. So that's one of the big myths that I wanted to bust for everybody. OK, um, and this is, you know, of course, obviously, this is going to be through a bullish market cycle. So you're definitely going to outperform in a bullish market cycle uh, and underperform in a bearish market cycle. OK, so, you know, the losses are going to be amplified. But if you take a look here, guys, I mean, this is this is a huge, huge difference in amount of money, fifty thousand dollars compared to three hundred and twenty three thousand dollars. And that's just simply if you were using a buy and hold buy and hold strategy of the underlying index, okay? Um, in this type of market, leverage ETFs may or may not outperform the index. It's depending on three factors, right? Well, number one is going to be the magnitude of daily volatility. Number two is going to be the speed and magnitude of overall market returns. And number three is going to be the leverage multiple. As multiple increases market exposure linearly, but increases volatility decay exponentially. So in the real world, leveraged ETFs behave thusly over any particular time period. If volatility is low, leverage is not too high, or markets rise quickly, leveraged ETFs will outperform the index despite volatility decay. But if volatility is high, leverage is too high, or markets rise slowly, leveraged ETFs will not outperform the index due to the volatility decay. Um, and, you know, so we have another graph here, right? And so uh, if an investor made ongoing investments into uh, Yule Picks, right, versus the S&P 500, for example, $100 per month, instead of a lump sum in 1997, they stated that uh, outperforming the S&P 500 by around 2016 all the way to present day, although the 2020 COVID crash almost brought the two portfolios back to parity, as of August 2021, the Yule Picks portfolio has a significant advantage, right? And so this is going to be a 2x leveraged portfolio. And we can see here that, you know, and in basically investing $100 per month in the Yule Picks, all right, during this time period from 1997 to August 2021, outperformed uh, dollar cost averaging, right, is basically the term that we're going for here by investing $100 per month into an index fund. We can see that, you know, buying into the 2x leverage ETF actually gave you $193,000 versus $117,000. So, you know, you can see that the decline here was very, very great uh, in, in, you know, times of increased volatility. Uh, and, you know, when the market is, you know, basically in a bearish cycle, this thing is going to underperform definitely just the 1x leverage ETF. But these are just really, really interesting statistics here, guys, you know, um, that there's a lot of myths that, you know, if you're buying into these leveraged ETFs, that you're guaranteed to really just lose your money and that they're not suitable for long term growth. Now, while we did look at UNG and Boyle and, you know, just buying and holding those have definitely not been uh, successful investment strategies. Um, you know, I just wanted to bust the myth, right? Like, you know, if you think that natural gas is going to have a big move sometime soon, right? Whether it's up or down, you could potentially invest in boil or cold based off of the move that you think it's going to make. And yes, there is going to be volatility decay. But there's also going to be the roll decay. All right. But you know, uh, there is the chance that it could actually outperform, right? And we'll take a look and go back to this uh, slide right here. Uh, and these are the real world situations where, you know, you could potentially uh, get an outperformance, right? And so that's if volatility is low, leverage is not too high, 
or the markets rise quickly, leveraged ETFs will outperform the index despite the volatility decay. But if the volatility is super high, leverage is too high, or markets rise slowly, leveraged ETFs will not outperform the index due to volatility decay. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, reiterate that. Now, again, remember, none of this video is financial advice. I personally have no positions in boil. Uh, I don't have any positions in the leveraged ETF for natural gas. Um, so I'm not trying to convince you guys to buy into it or to convince you not to buy into it, but rather just make a video about the decay and then some of the myths behind holding these leveraged ETFs. OK, um, now I'm not convinced necessarily that your picks really does a good job of providing 2x returns. If we compare it to another 2x S&P 500 leverage ETF, such as SSO, we see that your picks lags behind significantly. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. But SSO is pulling further and further ahead of your picks. I should point out that your picks has a higher expense ratio than SSO. Uh, but I haven't done the math on whether that expense ratio alone explains the difference. So if you take a look here, like a lump sum investment from 2006 to August 2021 of $10,000 in your picks, that would have resulted in about $72,000 versus SSO would put you up here at about $86,000. Um, with all of that said, I think that investors using leverage need to be exceptionally careful. All too often, leverage has resulted in complete disaster for both individuals and institutions. And that's why they call that thing the widow maker. OK, a lot of times it can result in complete disasters if you're not really know what you're doing or have some type of risk management. We rarely make life decisions based on what is purely mathematically optimal and using leverage to chase returns takes that concept to an extreme. But thank you guys for watching. Happy investing. Uh, if you're looking to start a position in UNG or Boyle, all right, um, you or even cold, there is something called option contract hedging that you could do. So let's say you're buying Boyle contracts or Boyle shares in hopes that it would go up. What you can do is you could actually hedge your portfolio and hedge your Boyle position with put option contracts. OK, and so I have a whole video explaining how to hedge uh, stock positions with put option contracts. So definitely watch that video. It's going to be coming up right now.